chapter 15, Roland, who has gone through hell and fought a polar bear, survived a sinking ship which sank in minutes, survived on an iceberg and then went through a legal battle in Britain over the insurance of the ship, has just been arrested for kidnapping, which he did not do. In New York City, there are homes permeated by a moral atmosphere so pure, so elevated, so sensitive to the vibrations of human woe and misdoing that their occupants are removed completely from all consideration of any but the spiritual welfare of poor humanity. In these homes, the news-gathering, sensation-mongering daily paper does not enter. In the same city are dignified magistrates, members of clubs and societies who spend late hours and often fail to arise in the morning in time to read the papers before the opening of court. Also in New York are city editors, bilious of stomach, testy of speech, and inconsiderate of reporters' feelings and professional pride. Such editors, when a reporter has failed, through no fault of his own, in successfully interviewing a celebrity will sometimes send him news gatherings in the police courts, where principal news is scarce. On the morning following the arrest of John Rowland, three reporters, sent by three such editors, attended a hall of justice presided over by one of the late rising magistrates mentioned above. In the anteroom of this court, ragged, disfigured by his clubbing and disheveled by his night in a cell, stood Roland, with other unfortunates more or less guilty of offense against society. When his name was called, he was hustled through a door along a line of policemen, each of whom added to his own usefulness by giving him a shove and into the dock where the stern-faced and tired-looking magistrate glared at him. Seated in a corner of the courtroom were the old gentlemen of the day before, the young mother with little Myra in her lap, and a number of ladies, all excited in demeanor and all but the young mother directing venomous glances at Roland. Mrs. Selfridge, pale and hollow-eyed, but happily faced with all, allowed no wandering glance to rest on him. The officer who had arrested Roland was sworn and testified that he had stopped the prisoner on Broadway while making off with the child, whose rich clothing had attracted his attention. Disdainful sniffs were heard in the corner with muttered remarks. Rich indeed, the idea the flimsiest prince Mr. Gaunt, the prosecuting witness, was called to testify. This man, your honor, he began, excitedly, was once a gentleman and a frequent guest of my house. He asked for the hand of my daughter, and as his request was not granted, threatened revenge. Yes, sir, and out on the broad Atlantic where he had followed my daughter in the guise of a sailor, he attempted to murder that child, my grandchild but was discovered. Wait, interrupted the magistrate. Confine your testimony to the present offense. Yes, your honor. Failing in this, he stole or enticed the little one from its bed, and in less than five minutes the ship was wrecked, and he must have escaped with the child in... Were you a witness of this? I was not there, your honor. But we have it in the word of the first officer, a gentleman... Step down, sir, that'll do. Officer, was this offense committed in New York? Yes, your honor, I caught him myself. Who did you steal the child from? That lady over yonder. Madam, will you take the stand? With her child in her arms, Mrs. Selfridge was sworn and in a low, quavering voice repeated what her father had said. Being a woman, she was allowed by the woman-wise magistrate to tell her story in her own way. When she spoke of the attempted murder at the taffrail, her manner became excited. Then she told of the captain's promise to put the man in irons, on her agreeing to testify against him, of the consequent decrease in her watchfulness, and her missing the child just before the shipwreck, of her rescue by the gallant first officer, and his assertion that he had seen the child in the arms of this man, the only man on earth who would harm it of the later news 
that a boat containing sailors and children had been picked up by a Mediterranean steamer of the detectives sent over, and their report that a sailor answering this man's description had refused to surrender a child to the consul at Gibraltar and had disappeared with it of her joy at the news that Myra was alive and despair of ever seeing her again until she had met her in this man's arms on Broadway that day. At this point, outraged maternity overcame her. With cheeks flushed and eyes blazing scorn and anger, she pointed at Roland and all but screamed. And he has mutilated, tortured my baby. There are deep wounds in her little back, and the doctor said only last night that they were made by a sharp instrument. And he must have tried to warp and twist the mind of my child or, or put her through frightful experiences, for he has taught her to swear horribly. And last night at bedtime, when I told her the story of Alicia and the bears and the children, she burst out into the most uncontrollable screaming and sobbing. the newspaper? No, it said she hasn't. Oh. It was describing that pretty much everyone in the courtroom doesn't yeah. read the newspaper. <laughs> One thing I will say, it's very clear that Myra believes this. So it's not necessarily that she's making this up and lying to put... Yeah. She believes this. So that's something that will need to be overcome in order to set the record straight. It's not like she's conspiring. She's misinformed. And given the path of the story, you can see why she thinks that. Sucks for you, Roland. Here her testimony ended in a breakdown of hysterics, between sobs of which were frequent admonishments to the child not to say that bad word, for Myra had caught sight of Roland and was calling his nickname. What shipwreck was this? Where was it? Asked the puzzled magistrate of nobody in particular. The Titan called out half a dozen newspaper men across the room. The Titan, repeated the magistrate. Then this offense was committed on the high seas under the English flag. I cannot imagine why it was brought into this court. Prisoner, have you anything to say? Nothing, Your Honor. And the answer came in a kind of dry sob. The magistrate scanned the ashen-faced man in rags and said to the clerk of the court, Change this charge to vagrancy, eh? The clerk, instigated by the newspaper men, was at his elbow. He laid a morning paper before him, pointed to certain big letters, and retired. Then the business of the court suspended while the court read the news. After a moment or two, the magistrate looked up. Prisoner, he said sharply, take your left sleeve out of your breast. Roland obeyed, mechanically, and it dangled in his side. The magistrate noticed and read on. Then he folded the newspapers and said, You are the man who was rescued from the iceberg, are you not? The prisoner bowed his head. Discharged! The word came forth in an unjudiciary roar. Madam, added the magistrate with a kindling light in his eye, this man has merely saved your child's life. If you will read of his defending it from a polar bear when you go home, I doubt that you will tell it any more bear stories. Sharp instrument, <laughs> which was equally unjudicial on the part of the court. Mrs. Selfridge, with a mystified and rather aggrieved expression on her face, left the courtroom with her indignant father and friends while Myra shouted profanely, for Roland, who had fallen into the hands of the reporters. They would have entertained him after the manner of the craft, but he would not be entertained, neither would he talk. He escaped and was swallowed up in the world without, and when the evening papers appeared that day, the events of the trial were all that could be added to the story of the morning. End of chapter 15.